There are some things you need to know, and these things are the most important things in your life. You will only come to this knowledge if you can humble yourself to consider something different than you currently believe. We believe things that we want to believe and can be changed from that only if we have a love of the truth. We need to understand that there is truth and error, and truth is unique and singular. Anyone who loves the truth can find it because it is logical and fits everything about life perfectly together. Unfortunately, for many if they are faced with the truth, it may not be what they wanted, what they expected. We must have what we want. Frequently we can get what we want, but usually at a high cost. That can be a high ethical and moral cost. We can live against our conscience especially if we believe there is no God, and thus no afterlife, meaning no consequences. People frequently believe that if they do not cause a great deal of trouble, even if there is another existence, they will avoid anything undesirable after death. Yet, believing something to be true does not make it true. Considering what is at stake, you need to be sure. We judge most things by our experiences in our temporary physical reality, and that is limited in terms of what we can understand by the nature of God's design. We mentally peek over into what comes next in our awareness of each person leaving their bodies. All we really understand is the certainty that life ends. Our bodies have a limited existence. This world is a beautiful place, but very primitive in terms of what is coming. It is simply a testing ground. God designed in what humankind has called science and time, along with many physical aspects. All of those things are primitive, and all will be gone when He brings an end to everything. However, one thing will remain and it is eternal and a component of being in the image of God. That is, it is humankind. Humankind possesses something different than all of the other living things in creation, and it is an eternal existence that does not end when the body is corrupted. I use the word primitive to describe our present experience. The primitive aspects are everything physical including our bodies and time. Science is only an associated built-in character that can explain some things of our temporary existence. That built-in science is not capable of allowing us to understand our origins, the creation. In fact, science is a very temporary thing, for there will be no science in the next existence. Actually, with a little thought, what would be the reason for science in an existence that was not physical, and where there was no time? First, the things just mentioned are interesting, and might be encouraging that is to know of God's creation, of His oversight. If you begin to grasp that life is about the soul, and that our existence continues after our death, then these are the important things. Knowledge of our post-human existence is a most valued understanding. God is generous to let us know more about our ongoing existence. How will this knowledge affect our life choices? All other explanations, even if they sound logical, are from sources that really do not know. God speaks of an end to humankind's existence. For instance, in 2 Peter 3, verses 10 to 12, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Now, consider that God created time for humankind as an important component for their existence. Titus 1 verse 2, in hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Yet, God indicates that time has no power over him. 2 Peter 3 verse 8, But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. God's domain is infinitely more powerful than the place He designed for humankind's test. We see that in how God creates everything by speaking each thing into existence. Humankind has a wonderful opportunity to correctly understand things beyond our present existence if we love the truth. Indeed, our existence is comparatively primitive, albeit perfect for God's test. So, the next existence will be very different, but your focus must be on your soul. The important things are the things that are unseen, the things that we might call spiritual, the things like God, our soul, heaven and its dreaded counterpart, and God defines sin and its forgiveness. Succeeding in life requires knowledge of certain things beyond your senses, like the gospel message. Also succeeding in life is assisted by or we might say encouraged by knowing about things that are associated with the afterlife, spiritual things only knowable from God. Those things are found in the Word of God. 
immediately the mind rushes off to finding problems with such an idea. It might be expected that one questions the fairness of such a statement. We can provide a long list of categories of persons that would seem unlikely to be able to access such information. It might include those of certain religions, perhaps those with limited mental abilities to comprehend, and those who have been misled by unscrupulous and perhaps charismatic persons. So we have established a strong set of excuses and then say God's way cannot be fair. You might be overlooking that God is perfect, and in his design, any person is capable of finding the truth. God did not provide his way and then make it impossible for some to achieve what is needed. People who love the truth will be able to find it and then do what is required. Humankind does not know how to deal with perfection. For instance, if there were a problem with someone being incapable of knowing or doing something essential for their success, God could handle it and handle it perfectly. Thus, you do not have to reject God's way because you have found a problem with it. Here is the short version of the unseen things you should know. 1. Your existence will continue after your bodily demise. 2. You will find yourself in Hades, either in paradise or the place of torment. Hades is a holding place until the last day. 3. Essentially, your eternity is settled at the moment of your death, since judgment is based on the things done in the body, and your body is gone. 4. While in the physical realm you are fighting a war, and it is very personal because it is you versus sin, a spiritual war. 5. Dying in sin means you have failed. 6. Your final existence will be in the new heaven and new earth with the Father and the Son, or it will be in the lake that burns with fire, which is the second death. God's existence is obvious in creation, and he states it like this. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You can also know from the scriptures themselves that God is the God of the Bible. Life seems to be about endless things involving issues that affect the world, about wars, about families, about education, about laws, about power, about social issues, about love, about hate, about survival, about sports, about health and disease, about science, about belief systems, about wealth and poverty, about the environment, about food, about retirement, about travel, about careers, and the list is never ending. However, life is not really about any of these things, but life is about the soul. It is about the quality of your life in relation to your Creator. Why? because all the things mentioned will be gone when you die, except for your soul. How did you live in relation to God-defined sin? Did you die in sin? None of the things you valued as important remain. They are meaningless. Now the things done in your body can be broken down into good and evil, and they will form the things of your judgment. In a sense your judgment without the details will be known to you by your immediate location in Hades. A great deal will be known in that instant, and it is unchangeable. In the failed life, your condition can be described as insurmountable regret. That regret will undoubtedly include your many bad decisions, and among them will be a failure to seek God. Your confidence in what men devised and then promoted about God and life will be seen as the worst things you ever believed. All your very good excuses for rejecting God will be very regrettable. God was obvious, and you never learned all he had to offer. You never understood his desire for you to succeed. You never understood how he suffered to provide you the opportunity to succeed. You could have known all the things in his plan that were there for you. His love is seen in his son. His warnings is seen in the need to fear him. His proclamations in relation to the terrible punishment if you reject his son. Indeed, in God's plan, the tough things from God either wake you up to life's reality and you become serious about all God says, or those things make you bitter. God gets what he wants, namely those who love him in their obedience and receive their reward or in their disobedience, they fail in life. God has defined the process to succeed, and each person can choose to follow that path. Indeed, God is perfect in everything, and his test just like his creation is flawless in achieving his purpose. There is one more thing you need to know, and it may be the most important thing. One might wonder why Jesus revealed this, but it is consistent with doing everything possible to bring seriousness to your life, seriousness to the message from God. Jesus reveals this in Matthew 7 verses 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it.
Few is the outcome for humankind and it is certain. Does this encourage you or discourage you? When you look at God's rules and observe the selfishness, the deceit, the pride, the cruelty, and the outright brazen disobedience in the world, it seems that few will succeed. As I look at all scripture, especially the past judgments of God, it seems few may be a much smaller number than I might have envisioned. The number of people saved in the flood was eight out of what may have been millions. Sodom and Gomorrah was quite large, and only Lot and his two daughters were saved, as Lot's wife chose to look back to the cities. God's judgment of Jerusalem was complete with approximately 1.1 million killed and about 97,000 taken as slaves, with an unknown number being scattered to areas around the Mediterranean. So how many is Jesus referring to? There is no way to know, but based on past judgments, few may be very few. First you need to be in the body of Christ to succeed, and then you need to live faithfully. And that includes carrying the message. We are told in 1 Peter 4 verses 17 and 18, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? If you understand Catholics and Protestants are not in the body of Christ, and much of the world stands in opposition to God, and finally many in the body of Christ must live up to God's high expectations, then you might be able to reach a conclusion about the few. Many take the word of God casually and think they are better than most and will succeed. However, the test and its judgment is not of a comparative nature, but is relative to how you live in relation to God's directives. God does not want any to fail, but for all to come to repentance. Many hear that God is the God of love and conclude he could not condemn anyone eternally. Humankind has all sorts of thoughts about God, but the truth is only found in what he has revealed about himself. God is very objective, and there will be no subjective judgments. The love of God is all on the cross as God's unspeakable gift of his Son to humankind. Love will not be found in forgiving sin in some random, undefined way, but by the gospel message. There is no other way. Very objective. In God's perfection, there must be righteousness, fairness, and no partiality. How can one succeed? Truly life's battle is with yourself. More specifically, it is between you and sin. Undoubtedly, this is not on your list of battles to be fought. However, it is the only one that matters. So many times we try to align with others in how we live. Everybody is doing this or that and being stylish and speaking in this certain way or going to this place or that. Maybe it is popular for people to have a bucket list or travel to this destination. And so those things become part of who you are. If you are going to be eternally successful, then you need to think on your own, since the many typically are living for this present existence and getting all they can. Education, especially colleges, seldom promote a philosophy that is centered on God. But the opposite, especially in the present, colleges deliver a selfish, cruel, and very specific message to students that looks like the very personal philosophies of the college. An observation of students would be that they do not develop the ability to think on their own. Then when you add a very prejudiced media, young people do not have the truth about life or seemingly any way to find it. When the religions of the world are present, it brings a different but also confusing view. The science of humankind brings in another level of confusion while claiming to have the answers. In this mess, people can seldom sort good from evil. This only matters because you will still exist after you die and God will be judging what you did in the body. Thus, our question is, how can you succeed? The very accurate answer is, do not die in sin. There is spiritual stuff you need to know. To do that you need to care to know. You need to create a crack in this wall of deceit and confusion. You will never do that in selfishness, pride, greed, where you are always working to look good. Instead you need to demonstrate a love for the truth by seeking it with your whole being. You would do that by realizing it is the only way to succeed. You might say, who is going to live for something other than themselves? You are right, very few. You might observe there is no true, lasting happiness in our physical existence. Yet in the scriptures there is a means of having a reasonable peace of mind on earth, by knowing in faithfulness where you are headed. Following your earthly existence there will be an eternal peace in heaven. Those things are typically not in the vision of humankind. However, they can be. How badly do you want to finish your life successfully? The world has little to no hope in being successful in the only thing that matters their eternity. God and the church of his son have been routinely disrespected, 
and it began in the latter part of the first century. Clearly, by the fourth century his church could not be recognized. There remained only a few holding to the doctrine of Christ. The obvious casualty was the loss of the gospel message. We might say the perversion of the gospel message as Paul referred to it in Galatians. In the present time among those who have a belief in God, albeit very flawed, are unable to even defend God's existence. The core problem since the early days of the Lord's Church is the same, namely the absence of the gospel message. The truth is missing. The power of God shines through when there is truth, but there is little truth in the world. For a very long time there have been so-called Christian religions, but contain no Christians. Yet this may be difficult to grasp, but those groups still to various degrees claim the scriptures as their guide. But not surprisingly, they were not solid in their commitment to the word of God. They had changed God's word in various ways. It was not God's meaning, and thus they were operating without any connection with God. They were not in the body of Christ, his spiritual church. Consequently, they were not able to pray to God or worship him. Although they could go through the motions, gradually the principles found in the scriptures were being abandoned. For instance, God defined sin was becoming acceptable, whereas the truth in its power is perfect and easily defendable. That is not true of the many half-truths of the world's religions. So-called Christianity, such as Catholicism and Protestantism, never had a relationship with God and thus no power to sustain itself by spiritual means, that is by the truth. Thus, the longevity of humankind's religions depended on various physical techniques which would be consistent with physical religions. These would include various threats, and in earliest times, various cruel actions, including torture and murder. Clearly these threats were from men and not God, and were designed to maintain the religion's power over the people. Although there had always been no spiritual value in these so-called Christian religions, there was still some respect for God. Over time it is not surprising that without the appropriate understanding of God and His Word, their ability to stand for even the most basic principles would be impossible, i.e. God's existence and His identity as the God of the Bible. Now, even these most basic fundamentals are being questioned. It always comes back to a disrespect of God's Word. God's Word must be honored, taken very seriously. That disrespect began with the early so-called Church Fathers and evolved within the churches until it was called the Catholic Church, and then much later the Protestant churches came in opposition to Catholicism with another false version of the Gospel. People have not taken what God says seriously. As the Scriptures declare, let God be found true and every man a liar. Jesus pointed to the need to have everyone honor every word that comes from the mouth of God. These so-called Christian religions take a very casual approach to the Word of God, and in their past, and until this day they do the worst possible thing. They change the Word of God. So, is there any hope for humankind? There is always hope because some to this day in various places around the world respect the Word of God and know the truth. They know of the Gospel message. The things of the first century, of what God accomplished in Christ, are still available. God points to the need for a person to have a love of the truth, such that a person might be saved. Those are not just words, words to be taken casually. But God is telling each person this is an attitude they need. You should not accept less than the truth. The only hope for humankind has not changed since it was defined in the first century when people were added to the body of Christ by the Lord himself via their obedience. It might be very overwhelming to realize the world's religions cannot help anyone succeed. They also lead people to believe they are on the right path with heaven in their future. So much so that thinking they have the truth, they stop looking. Error massacres the soul. How can this be? It should not be surprising that men and women have changed God's meaning to reflect something more acceptable to them. If you love the truth, you will find these terrible doctrines of humankind's religions are pathetic lies. One thing you might consider will be how all the Christian religions are so very different in their doctrines. That points to no solid, easily understood truth, but to many private interpretations of the Word of God. Also, the methods used to promote these religions have not been representative of God's character as He has revealed Himself. In addition, the so-called Christian religions absolutely miss the mark in terms of the most basic things, like the spiritual nature of the church started by Jesus. These so-called Christian religions are rule-making institutions, very physical in nature, and thus do not address the problem Jesus died to resolve, namely the forgiveness of sin, a very spiritual problem. Is it any wonder that the world is such a mess? Life is about the soul. Life is about God's test. 
but God is seldom mentioned in the daily conversations. People are uncomfortable discussing God. It continues to get worse. In the present time, people die and are horrified with their outcome. There is this window called a person's lifetime, and each person needs to get it right. People spend their lives being distracted by the things of the world that are so important, but really of zero value. These six books represent helps in each person's quest for sharing in the divine nature. They can only help if they are consistent with the Word of God. The things of God's Word are the evidence from God for His existence and for what He requires to succeed. Indeed, God is the God of the Bible. 